Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Isaac. And this is your boy, Bryce. And we are Brothers on Tennis. And folks, we are very, very quickly rounding out this tennis season. Bryce, I mean, we had the Master Series Paris event for the men. The ladies were like, look, we up in the finals and we we going to deal with this, <laughs> with this thing we got. <laughs> I mean, talk to us, brother. What was your what was your overall thoughts on this? What I guess could be considered the final week of the of the regular tour. Yeah, I mean, well, and I'll start with the men. I mean, I think the results that we're seeing are the type of results that we see on the men's tour at the end of the year. Right. You know, some of the top players, they're losing early. They look tired. They're looking like they don't even really want to be there. And right. then you got players that ain't done nothing all year long, Dimitrov. Um, <laughs> and, you know, now they showing out because everybody else is tired. But <laughs> uh, So you had that going on for the men in Paris. Yeah. And then for the women, year in championships, and I'm sure we'll talk in a few minutes about how crazy that's been this week. But yes. all I'm going to say is, aside from the results, the organization and the scheduling and all of that of, you know, the season culminating tournament has got to be better. Yes. This was the worst I've ever seen. Um, and I would not be surprised if somebody lost their job over there. I, in fact, aren't they calling for it? I, I mean, I actually mm -hmm. thought that there were, you know, that we've been hearing some rumblings that someone should lose their job based on this. And and right. rightfully so, rightfully so, because for that major of an event, I mean, we're talking about the yearning championships, which is basically the the fifth highest point ranking, you know, tournament of the mm -hmm. entire year behind the Grand Slams. And for it to just be basically thrown together and the conditions that they were having to deal with it was just yeah bryce it, it was it was bad it was bad yeah yeah was, so you know those were the two tournaments for this week um and so i'm ready to dive into whichever one you want to hit first <laughs> well i mean we've already kind of started talking about the dumpster fire that is the wta final so let's go ahead and just jump in to that one, we can start talking about the results and we can kind of weave in our thoughts as it relates to the conditions and, and whatever else the kind of pops in our head as it relates to that tournament. Well, I was going to say we probably for people that weren't following it should probably give them a bit of background. Yes. Um, and and with the women's year end championship, like Isaac is saying, you know, behind the four majors, this is the next biggest tournament of the year in yes. terms of points and money and prestige. Uh, many times this is the tournament like this year that will determine who is the year ending number one player on the women's side. And Isaac, I think it wasn't until what, after the U S open that we even found out where the year ending championships was going to be played. That's right. And and I don't know, maybe my expectations are too high, but I thought or I figured that's something you should know at the start of the year. Correct. I mean, unless like something has happened and the, the site that was picked at the beginning of the year was damaged somehow and now we have to move it last minute. Right. Unless it's a situation like that, we should know come like January 1st where the year ending championship is going to be. And so there was a lot of drama all the way through, what, end of August, beginning of September, of was it going to be in Europe? Was it going to be in Mexico, the States, Asia, you know, Saudi Arabia? I mean, all these places were being tossed around. So once again, for the catching the people up that weren't, may not have been up on this, once they did decide that it was going to be in Cancun, the week of the tournament, when the players started arriving, they were still putting in the final nails on the stadium. Right. So that wasn't a good look. People weren't feeling good about that. Mm -hmm. And then on top of all of that, the year ending championships is usually played indoors because this is a tournament that you can't take the risk of having inclement weather and other things that you know, could impact the matches. Well, this is in Mexico during a time when it rains right. and storms, and it did. Um, and the wind was crazy. 
And 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 I guess the impact was in this tournament, you're hoping that you know you have the best eight women players in the world, and you want them to be able to produce the best tennis that they can. Correct. And this was like Folly's tennis, right? <laughs> you know, trying to you know, the, the wind is moving the ball, you're 40 degrees to the left, 40 degrees to the right. And so, like Isaac said, Steve Simon, the, the CEO of the WTA, and if you followed us for any period of time, we've been busting on the WTA for a while now because of the website and other things that they just can't seem to get together. Um, finally, some players and other people in the community have started calling for his job, namely, um, who's always afraid to bring up a subject, Martina Navratilova, you know, uh, and and she even went as far as to say she thinks he should be replaced by a woman, right? Because the women's tour should have a women's leader. Because in all of these fifty something years that this tour has been around, there have only been three women to have led uh, the organization. So there are plenty of qualified women out there for the job. And um, Isaac, did I miss anything? Does that Kind of, I, you know, absolutely, Bryce, and for, and and definitely, I will say, uh, we we have someone in mind who who, who could take that spot. Um, uh, <laughs> a good friend of our, ours of, of the show, we 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 love her. She used to be USTA president. Anyway, um, <laughs> the only thing I guess I would I would want to add, Bryce, is mm -hmm. for the listeners again, because we want to get you caught up on this story. This isn't a one time thing. So the same thing has happened over the years. So, so last year, they didn't know the location up until around the U.S. Open, and they basically threw it in Texas. So it was in Texas. And folks, would, here, here's the thing. When you have such a significant event, you have to allow for the necessary planning to happen in order to have a successful event. So like Bryce said, the fact that they're still trying to get the courts together and they still nailing things in when players are already arriving, unacceptable. The fact that they didn't even get a chance to play on the courts. So the people who honestly, who played the first day's matches didn't even get the ability to actually play and fill out the court. So they were actually giving people who were, or some of the ladies who were playing on the second day an advantage because if they were able to either practice or play doubles on the first day, then they at least got a chance to fill out the court. If this is your year ending tournament, you absolutely, that is unacceptable. You have right. to allow them to be able to play on the court because as you know, folks, there are different surfaces and even with specific surfaces, there can be a different or variety of things that can make your shot and or your game different. So you have to be able to understand what those things are to build your game plan to play your best tennis. They didn't get an opportunity to do any of that, folks. It's just no. unacceptable. Yeah, yeah, and that's well put. Um, so I really do think because of how bad it was this year, you're going to see some changes. And and you even have players still once again calling for, will the ATP and the WTA merge? Because the ATP tends to do things a little better, right? Not saying that the ATP is perfect. Nope. But – um, well, at least they, apparently, apparently they caught the a WTA bug because when I tried to download one of the double draws for Paris, it didn't have the finalist name. I was like, mm, all right, Shay. <laughs> but anyway, back oh, to Oh, my Shay. gosh. But um, but all of that being said, you know, I think going into the year ending championship, there were three major storylines, right? It was for three players. You had the current number one, Sabalenka, you know, that needed to perform, you know, at a certain level to yes. be able to end the year, number one. Iga, who was the number two player in the world, basically had to win out yes. to become number one in the world. So you have two people that have a chance to end the year, number one. And then kind of the hot player coming in uh, was Coco Gauff. Right. And so, you know, she was coming off of last year having not won a match at the year ending championships uh, to her breakout season this year, you know, what was she going to do? And I don't think there was a whole lot of expectation for anybody else. Right. 
right. that had made the championship. And I think, you know, <laughs> how did it end up playing out? Well, you know, Bryce, it, it was as far as the storyline for Coco, um, mm-hmm. thankfully, she was able to get in there and, and, and you know, win some matches. So that was good um, because, uh, again, she was placed in the same group as uh, Iga Sviatek, who we have talked about on many mm-hmm. occasions with Coco's game the way it is right now. Coco don't want to see no parts of Iga because Iga going to eat right. that game up air single time. And that's exactly what she did in the round robin. She she basically exposed that weakness, knew when to play to Coco's strength, and just just literally did not make it even a contest. So in that regard, that has to be a little bit, you know, frustrating for Coco. But at the same time, she got in there and she played against, uh, who is it, uh, Vondrosova, Wimbledon champion, and got Uh a victory there. And was it, who did you play, Sakari? Um... Trying to think yeah, of the person remember. in their group. I honestly can't remember. But no, anyway. uh, was it Jabur? Oh, maybe it was Jabur. Maybe it was Jabur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd forgotten. Yes. All it was Jabur. Yeah. yeah. But so she got two good wins. So definitely mm-hmm. improved upon last, you know, last year's results. Um, but again, we all know there's work that needs to be done in the game, specifically on the forehand, especially against Iga Sviatek. Because again, I, I Coco's current game, I will put against any of the other women players and give her a very, very good fighting chance to win that match. I will put good mm-hmm. coin, y'all, good coin mm-hmm. on that matchup. But if you bring Iga on the court and you ask me to put my good coins on a match between her and Coco, <laughs> That ain't gonna happen. And right. Bryce, I don't know how you feel, but it, to me, it, it's just a bad, a bad matchup. But I am proud of Coco for at least improving upon what she did last year. And I'll pass it over to you, my man. Right. And the only loss she took in the round robin was to Ego, six love, seven five. Um, and she made it to the semifinals. Um, where we will transition this story to the story of another American. Uh, she met her good friend and doubles partner in the semifinal, um, Jessica Pagula, who or Pegula, yeah. who went through her group and slayed everybody: Rabakina, Fabalenka, and um, who was the other one? Sakari. Sakari, yeah, who who had made it in because Mahova had to pull out. Correct. So Sakari made it in on the humble. And she got ha- handled by all three she of the did. people in her group. But, you know, nobody, I don't think, expected, especially not in that group, for Pagula to come out undefeated 3-0. and And she said she wasn't ready to stop even after that because she went and got a hold of Coco and said, <laughs> now, hold on. I know you're probably going to end the year the top-ranked American, but no, not tonight. Mm-hmm. And but- so. Yeah, so Pagula then finds herself in the finals, four and zero. Yeah, yeah. And, and Bryce, the only thing that I was going to say and put just sort of that mm-hmm. sprinkle, that asterisk on it, is, folks, this is where the conditions, inclement weather comes into play. Jess Pagula is a very, very solid, structured player. She plays mm-hmm. great, great forehands, great backhands. She knows how to play in tough conditions. Her game is reliable. It is very, mm-hmm. very reliable. Whereas Coco has to re, kind of re, re, rely on the athleticism to be and being creative in order to mm-hmm. s- sometimes get through matches when she's not playing mm-hmm. her best. And that wind and everything, Bryce. I mean, it 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 definitely caused her a lot of turmoil. Was whereas with Jess, Jess was like, "Well, I already kind of know how to play you. It just played a forehand." But mm-hmm. with all these winning conditions, all I need to do is just hit a clean ball. As long as I, as long as I hit a clean ball and get it ball, get the ball in, I got a good shot. And to me, cool. that's exactly – JPEG, she did exactly what she needed to do in that match against Coco to win. Well, and I think that was the advantage she had on all the players because since Jessica hits a very flat ball, her contact point in the win, she's able to maintain that better than – Let's take Coco, for example, who has this big wind up and is trying to hit this big loopy shot. And if the ball is moving around on you, that's a much more difficult thing to try to do consistently. 
Right. And and I think, like I said, Jessica had that over all the people she played. She could hit that very flat ball through the wind. Um, and like I said, I don't think anybody predicted, even if you predicted that she was going to win her group, you didn't think she was going to go 3-0 and then 4-0 in the semis to be in the finals. Right. Exactly. Agree 100%, bro. So... In that same group that Pagula was in, you have Sabalenka. And so at least Sabalenka was able to come in second place in that group. She was able to beat Rabakina. She was able to beat um, uh, Sakari, uh, which kept her in contention for this number one ranking. Right. Uh, and it was perfect because uh, Coco's group was won by an undefeated Iga who looked like all week she had someplace else to be. Like she was not trying to be out and not win for very long. And, um, the you know, she had some very reinforced walls for her bakery. And she set up shop and was conducting business. Same. But what, <laughs> so she is undefeated in her group. And she meets Sabalenka in the semis. And this just makes it perfect. Because now, Fabalenka, if she wins, you know, she's locked for number one for the year. Iga, even if she beats Sabalenka, still has to win the finals, right. you know, to become number one. So this truly was Sabalenka and Iga playing each other for the number one spot. And I tell you what, and, and Isaac and I were talking about this offline. We both kind of felt like Iga had a little dip this year. Not a big dip, I mean, clearly, but she had just a little bit of a dip this year, and I think she came into the year-end championship focused. And she was like, you know what? I'm going to show all these ladies what time it is. And her goal was to win, win out, and to end up number one for the year. So I knew Iga was coming in serious on that Sabalenka match, and she took her out three and two like it was routine. Routine. Um, and and so when we saw that and we were like, okay, we're going to now have Iga and Jess in the finals, even without, I don't care how flat a ball Jesse hits. <laughs> you know, a motivated Iga with, with, with Jessica being basically a speed bump between her and the number one ranking, it was not looking good. <laughs> no, it was not, Bryce. Not at all. And folks, I know we you, you we talked about Coco and again the conditions, and they're like, well, what well, well, wait a minute, Isaac. You know, Iga has a you know a pretty, pretty, you know, heavy, heavy uh semi, you know, western forehand. Why wouldn't she have problems? Here's here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Iga is what I consider to be very, very aggressive mm -hmm. on the court. Coco does not play a level of aggressiveness that Iga does. Iga is always looking to attack the ball, take it early. Take, I mean, she is always looking to be aggressive and do something with the ball. I think Coco relies on her athleticism to get her in positions that allows her to create special things. That is different than being aggressive with the ball. So right. when we bring it to Iga's game, Iga got out there and she was like, I'm not going to let the conditions worry me because I'm going to get my footwork right to where I can slap that ball very quickly and I can put my spin on it. And Iga has those quick, those quick, uh, you know, kind of tick strokes where mm -hmm. it doesn't, she doesn't take big windups. She's just always like, boom, 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 just very quick. Right. Again, attack. Right. Her right. mode is so aggressive, Bryce. And you know, you and I talked about this yet. I love Iga's. I love that aggressive. Right. She get out there and she's like, I'm not trying to play with you. I'm, I'm not trying to do any of that. I am trying right. to get you off the court and myself off the court as quickly right. as possible. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was the difference. Is she controlled the elements versus allowing the elements to control her. And right. she took that aggressiveness to, to Sabalenka and again, when things are on the line, we all know, you know, my girl and and y'all, y'all know how much I love Big Sab. I, that's my right. girl. But simply put, when Iga gets after it, you will have to bring something special to stop her. And there was right. no stopping her, as Bryce mentioned, y'all. When she came into this tournament, she came in focus. She was like, oh, I can get number one still? Oh, 
<laughs> you, you, you better you better get out the way. You better hope right. you're my path. Right. You know, watching Iga in this tournament, and I don't know why it hadn't hit me earlier, watching her play, who she reminds me of, believe it or not, mm-hmm. Steffi Graf. The way she runs around that forehand and uses that forehand yep. to set her up for the yep. kill shot, that, that's Steffi's game. That I mean, Steph- people game. may try to say, oh, you know, Steffi had the one-handed slice. She's got the two hand. That's a minor part of the game. It is the way that they dictate from the ground with that forehand. Both of them have impeccable footwork, like you were saying. Exactly. And I felt like I was watching a little modern-day miniature version of Steppy, Mm -hmm. Uh, especially with the scores. (laughs) Honestly, Bryce, she most definitely has taken that mindset from Steffi Graf because Steffi was handing out – she had her bakery, too. Let us not forget. (laughs) Before the Williams sisters jumped on tour, Steffi had her bakery, and she would open it on the daily. She did. Uh And and so we go to the finals – um, where like we're really thinking Eagle's gonna handle, but we didn't know she was gonna handle like she handled. I mean, she went and she said, You know what? We're gonna not only have pastries today at the bagel, but at, at, at you know, at the bakery, but we're gonna also have some drinks out here too. Yes. And she, look, y'all, there is no reason in the world why in the year ending championships you would ever have a final score of. A breadstick and a bagel. A breadstick and a bagel it, over Jessica Bagula. Who who was undefeated to that point in the tournament. Right. I mean, Peggy Lee looked like all she wanted to do was go to her hotel and count her money. <laughs> That's all she wanted to do because she had she had <laughs> count my stacks because she had nothing for e- Eagle was like, you you between me and number one, you have nothing for me. You nothing. and your little flat ground shows me to go on somewhere. <laughs> because I am about to run through you like a bad Mexican meal. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you. And she did. I mean, she yeah, really, yeah. really did. And yeah. I think she they said she set a record. They said like there had not been a champion that had lost as fewer games as her. Like, I think they said uh, Justine Enna lost 34 games in 2007. Mm-hmm. That had been the least amount of games lost previously. Eagle lost 20. Mm-hmm. Not surprising. 20. 20. Not surprising at all. Because, again, that's Ega's mindset. Ega is out. See, like, like we were talking about in the weekend, mm-hmm. Bryce. Ega ain't trying to be out there trying to practice shots. She was like, my game is solid. My game is good. And I need to go and, and, oh, let me try this angle and see if that works. So let me just, you know, throw off this game right. and I'll just play around. She, she like, no, my game is good. If I want to practice, <laughs> I'm going to go on the practice course and I'm going to practice. But right, when I'm right. in the match, I'm going to bring my game. I don't need yeah. to practice nothing. I know exactly what I need to do. It's all about executing. And that's exactly what she does. And so it doesn't oh. surprise me that she has, like, the record, I believe, for, like, the number of bagels and breadsticks handed out. Because, again, that bakery is – that the foundation of that bakery is so strong. strong. Yes. And you mentioned this on another show. I can't remember which one it was. But, you know – even though, and, and no disrespect to Sabalenka, because we do like Sabalenka. Absolutely. Even when she was number one, I think the feeling was t- you still had to go through Iga to win tournaments, right? Correct. I mean, she may have mathematically had the number one ranking, but I think Iga still had the spirit of being number one. Correct. Right. That fear and factor. It's definitely the fear factor, yes. And so I think it's only rightful that she ends the year number one. And, and and like the commentators were saying, the scary part about all of this is what a potential momentum boost this is for her going into 2024. I'm going to go on the record and say it right now. Sabalenka is not defending the Australian Open. And, and no. And, and unfortunately... I actually, and I, you, you and I talked about this this weekend. Mm-hmm. I actually think this is going to play quite negatively to Sabalenka 
because again, she was able to be the one to take that number one from Iga. She started out the year gangbusters. And then it just it's just those little things from the past just kept creeping in there. Those mental things, those you know, right. the French Open and Muhova and blah, blah, blah. And I just feel like the fact that she couldn't close the door and wrap up number one is going to be for the for the rep for the year in that mm -hmm. is going to sit on her spirit very, very heavy in 2024. So mm -hmm. I it, to me, it's going to take I, I just I don't know. I don't see her having as great a year next year. I would not mm -hmm. be surprised if we saw a dip, a, a, a major dip in Sabalenka's play next year. And yeah. it's but but again, that's just the game. Iga Iga is to me when you look at the game and you look at the person who should be number one in the world, mm -hmm. you kind of have to say it's Iga because Iga ain't got no weaknesses. The mental right. is strong. Every part of the game is strong. The serve, the right. backhand, the forehand, the movement. There is absolutely nothing in her game that is that that is weak. She she's so right. to me, it's. As much as I love Sabalek and I wanted her to, to get that year in number one, I think the right person actually holds that title. Right, right. So with all that being said, you know, shout out to all the top eight ladies for, for making it to the tournament. Extra shout out to Iga for, I mean, Iga could have easily lost any one of those matches in round robin. You know, she could have lost you know, in the semis, but with everything on the line, she came all the way through. She came all the way through. And, and that's all another piece of it, Bryce. All of that that she had on the line. Can you imagine right. the level of stress going into mm -hmm. that event? And she took that stress and was like, I'm going to use it as my foundation and get right. it done. And she took five matches, y'all, less than, I mean, 20 games lost, sets a mm -hmm. record. Yeah. And gets number one in the world. Y'all better quit hating on Iga. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what? And that's the crazy thing. You know, when we typically do our, our IG live post show after this, you know, there's a number of, of, of the BOT family that just ain't vibing Iga. And, and that's just a head scratcher for me because, you know, I just recognize the game, man. The I just. Strong, Game is strong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and she seems to be. I mean, granted, she's a little socially awkward, but that's. I don't know if that's a reason. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Other. You like who you like, but right, right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And and like I said, y'all, y'all again. You know, Big Sab, that's my girl. If if she mm -hmm. goes on the court, that's who I'm typically going to be rooting for. But again, uh, excepting as Coco, of course. But again, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Iga, Iga, to me, has been just a very, very strong, confident champion. And I mm -hmm. and I can't fault her for that. I can't, you know, folks may be like, oh, why she have to give everybody a bagel? Why she always, because, you know, everybody's all superstitious about getting bagel. Ah, Iga, like, oh, well, why would be superstitious? Why? <laughs> right, exactly. Why? And I'm not trying exactly. to be disrespectful to you, but apparently, if you need to, if you, you, sh you shouldn't be out on the court if you can't win a game. Simply put, mm -hmm. so don't be mm -hmm. mad at her. She ain't trying. Right. She, she she's not responsible for giving anybody any games. When you get on the court, you get on there to compete. And if you yep. can't win a game, that's on you. Don't be feeling bad. Don't be feeling angry because a lot of people mm -hmm. also take that. Bryce as well. Did she have to really give her a bagel? Why not? Right. I don't with that, absolutely not. So anyway, you can give her a golden set. Do it. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, hey, uh, uh, Shvedova. I forget was the one that gave the golden set uh, that that Wimbledon that one uh -huh. that one year. Anyway, yeah, Shvedova. Right. I think it was. <laughs> anyway, do it, y'all. So Iga, gonna do you. Right, right. So, <laughs> all right. So that's the women. So if we transition to the men, we sure. were back into Paris. Yes. Um. You know. Root and I guy, Gael Monfils, on as he took the L um, in the first round. Yeah. But, you know, other than Djokovic coming back, the man of the tournament was your guy, Grigor Dimitrov. Yes, sir. And I just want to say, you know, when you have a week, when you take out Musetti, Medvedev, Bublik, Perkech, 
and CC Pass? Come on. That's a week. That's a he week. He had a week. Yeah. Now, granted, he had all year to prepare for it. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying. Here's, here's the one thing I will say, Bryce. And this is, I think, a little bit of the story behind Dimitrov is that he mm-hmm. – apparently has been dealing he i think had that what's called the long covid mm-hmm. i think he was dealing with a lot of that and has had a lot of physical issues you know mm-hmm. since since he had and i think he's had covid a couple of times in fact and so i guess the long and the short of it is i think we actually saw the grigor dimitrov of pre-2017 when he was up there actually trying to compete Mm-hmm. with your Rogers, with your Rafa's, you know, with the, mm-hmm. the big three. Again, still taking those L's, but still getting through right. everybody else to get to that point to play them. And, right. you know, he's just taken a lot of losses over these last couple of years. So I am hoping that this is sort of a resurgence for him and will really allow him to really play hit some of his best tennis going forward because he still has a, mm-hmm. a good few, few really strong years ahead of him. He's in great physical condition so right. there's no reason why baby fed can't continue to you know really really deliver and produce these types of results because to me mm-hmm. he should he's got the talent he's got that talent so it's just a matter of him having you know just keeping it all together and doing it consistently hand it over to you brother. yeah and, and and the i guess the unfortunate side about that is that's what the story has always been you right. know, he's always had the talent, right? But he's never been able to really pull it all together. I'm even less hopeful at, in the later stages of his career going up against some of these young guys. I totally acknowledge he's had a really good couple of weeks. Um, but, you know, won't be surprised if when everybody's fresh back in Australia, you know, I, I'm just saying, I'm not hating on him. You know, he's very popular in the locker room. You know, everybody really likes him. But, you know, at the end of the day, do I see him, you know, going to even a major best of five sets, winning seven matches against the likes of Alcaraz and Djokovic and Medvedev? And I really don't. But I wish him well. And I'm happy that he – that's why I think he was crying at that final because he was like, oh, this was my – this was my chance, you know, to snag me something. <laughs> These guys gonna be all refreshed in January and everything. Well, but, and, uh, and, and Bryce, the one thing that I would definitely say is, at a minimum, he used mm-hmm. he needs to use this as momentum to get back in the winner circle. And when I say uh, that, I mean even at a two fifty level, because right, right. because simply put. His last title was the year ending championships in 2017. That's over six years, people. Mm-hmm. That's way too long for you to go without being in the winner circle. So he right. needs to, at a minimum, use this momentum, go play on rocks in Cambodia or wherever you need to mm-hmm. play, but 250, mm-hmm. but get mm-hmm. you a victory and start there. So put your, right. make your goal, get me a 250 and get me a title. So then that right. gets out of the way. And then continue to build, build so that you can produce some good tennis going into the Grand Slams. But to me, Bryce, it's it's very basic. He needs to at least lift a 250. Yeah, he, he does. And the fact that it's been six years since he's had a title, COVID or not, I mean. You exactly. Know. You're way too talented to not have a title in six plus years. That to right. me is kind of unacceptable. Right. But then the story ultimately for the tournament is your guy, Novak Djokovic. Yes, sir. He came back, um, you know, he basically just walked his way through the draw, you know, admired what Dimitrov did all week, and then was like, I know your game. (laughs) And I am not concerned, not one bit. No, no. About you in the finals. And he he, uh, proceeded to break him off. And kind of like the sub story that was going on at the same time is, and I, once again, I don't know if everyone everyone was keeping up, but the media started to make a big deal about, you know, Nadal had not come out and really acknowledged and congratulated um, Djokovic for getting 24 majors. Oh, I didn't even, and, even recognize that. Yeah, and basically when they did get 
uh, um, Nadal on the mic, he basically said, well, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, I, I, cause I can't remember the exact words he used, but basically the messages, the message that he, he stated was that Djokovic had kind of an unhealthy, um, attitude to, toward trying to get all these records. Oh, right. And, I, you know, Nadal was just kind of like, you know, I'm very proud, happy with what I've done, but, you know, it was never about chasing records and whatever. And he was basically saying he thought that Djokovic had a very unhealthy uh, kind of approach to that. And Djokovic came back out and basically was like, well, first of all, let's be real clear about something. I respect uh, Rafael Nadal, but uh, we are not friends. So, oh, right. oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, and, right. and, after he, and after he won this Paris Open, which was for a record seven times, he reiterated, oh, by the way, I'm going for all the records. Mm. So there is definitely, so I am super excited for Nadal to come back on the tour because there is definitely some beef there between Nadal and Djokovic. Now, I know they both will be extremely professional when they're on the court but you can bet they are not going to want to lose to each other each other exactly at all loving and, that. He, and you know Djokovic is probably sick of seeing the Fadal you know everything is better than a doll better than a doll you know and he just stuck out you know and the one little thing he got which which is the accomplishments Nadal was trying to poo poo on that like <laughs> Uh huh. Like unhealthy, <laughs> but you know, it's it, it, it. First of all, Nadal is correct, and I don't know why Joker is <laughs> taking any offense to it because it, it, he has been going after the after it, and that's mm -hmm. you know he, what he can probably you know go back on is the unhealthy piece. You could consider it to be unhealthy, but again, it's motivation. Each person right. gets motivated in a different way. He used it as a motivation. Now he's got those records. You know, right. cool. here's my thing though, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put this out here. Hopefully nobody was getting on the doll's back for not congratulating um, Novak for 24. Because simply put, yeah, Federer did it, but Federer's retired. Nadal is still an active player. Why are you going to have an active player giving somebody kudos for getting getting another Grand Slam? No, I'm not going to thank yeah. you. I'm not going to congratulate you for that. I'm still an active player. I'm still trying to chase some things myself. So, I, so hopefully they're not giving him any flack for not congratulating Djokovic. Because to me, that... It, it to me wasn't necessary per se, but I love the fact that there's some spiciness going on. I love that. Right. Love and that. so, so let me throw this to you. Yeah. So they were giving a little, uh, little heat to Serena. Uh oh. For not having congratulated. <laughs> no bad. Well. well. <laughs> I, to be honest with you, Bryce, I actually was sort of expecting to hear something from Serena as well. So when mm -hmm. I did, I was kind of like, ooh, okay. Right. That's kind of yeah. interesting. And I think that has more to do with Serena and less to do with Djokovic. Because again, remember, Serena never had any pressure to get 24 or chase and Margaret Court. She put that on right. herself. She put it right. on herself. And unfortunately, she didn't get it done. And so I think that that's always going to be one of those little black eyes for her. Is the mm -hmm. but again she did it to herself. So then yeah. the fact that somebody else, uh, Djokovic, came came and actually did what she was trying to do, I could see how she would be definitely a little salty behind it. But again, right, Serena, you know we love you, but sis, that's on you. That we never put that pressure on you to get twenty four because we know you're the greatest female player, right? As far as mm -hmm. single. Go because we don't want to get into the, all the other stuff, Martin. Right, <laughs> but exactly. you know what I'm saying. <laughs> right, right, right. Ah. Oh. So anyway, Bryce, it's it's. I love it, man. I love mm -hmm. because again, tension is good, and it's definitely right. good when you got it up at the top with the big three. Um, but right. yeah, they like to sit out there strong and be like, "We are not friends." I that ain't not that. <laughs> <laughs> he, I had I had to send that to somebody, but you know what I want, and this is just me being messy. But <laughs> what I want more than anything in the world, and it's not going to happen, so I'm not even trying to hype myself up on it. <laughs> I would love for Roger to show up and sit in Rafa's box. But Rafa plays Djokovic. You're messy. <laughs> 
I so want that more than anything in the world. And we I know. want that more than Venus Williams winning two matches in a row. <laughs> I'm telling you, I want to see that. Oh, brother, I'm sorry, but those two things might be a really, really, uh, yeah, that one, mm, <laughs> no, because we know Roger, you know, we, we know Roger ain't, ain't going to feed into the, into the, right. into the field, if you will. He's got too much, uh, too much respect. And again, he don't want to jeopardize them, them billions. He's sitting like Jesse. He's right. sitting up in his hotel room counting his stacks. He ain't going to put exactly. nothing at risk. <laughs> Exactly. He ain't putting them stacks at risk. No. Dude, he might give Djokovic a, uh, an apparel deal. <laughs> right? <laughs> you might see Djokovic with the O in with the on on his chest. <laughs> I'm telling you. Federer don't care. Give him make him some money. Federer trying to make that money, y'all. Do not get it twisted right. because lest we lest we uh reiterate, Federer is uh has the money of both Djokovic and the doll combined. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. So don't get it twisted. They may be considered the big be, to be the big three, but when it comes to them financials, it's a big one. It's a big one. And Federer is counting <laughs> stacks. Yes. Right. You better put that B in front of it. Exactly. For sure. So congratulations to Djokovic for, yes. you know, picking up a ma another Masters 1000, seventh one uh, in Paris. And, you know, he's looking strong because since Alcarez lost early, the chances of him coming back and snagging number year in number one now, you know, aren't looking um, as good. So I'm fully expecting for Djokovic to go into the year in championship um, and to do what he needs to do to lock up number one for this year. I absolutely agree. He's going to do it. And honestly, you know, when you win the three grand slams of the year, right. you deserve it. You, you deserve it. Right. I mean, you know, no shades of Carlos. You played, had a heck of a year, and I'm hoping that 2024 is even better. But yeah, this right. was definitely Djokovic's year. So, got to give him, got to give him those props. Oh, Bryce, I've got a question for you before we close things out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, we know, I believe they said that this was title number 97 mm -hmm. for Djokovic. Uh mm -hmm. Do you want to see Djokovic eclipse Jimmy, Con Jimmy Connors at 109? Yep. I figured that's yep. what you're gonna say. Mm -hmm. That's exactly yeah. my sentiment. Because I'm like, if he's already got the singles grand slams, I'm like, no, let's get, get go get, ahead and get it all. Get it all. <laughs> you know, don't leave Jimmy Connors with nothing. <laughs> I'm. Uh, uh, we, we, you, don't get me on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't want him to be left with nothing. Him with <laughs> six majors or whatever he got. Yeah. All I'm right. about no Jimmy Connors. Mm -hmm. Um. So anyway. Uh. Yeah. I just get 110 and then he can yeah. go ahead and he can retire. That, that would be the one, ter like, if he's sitting on 109, that would be the one time I would be voting on Djokovic at a tournament. Yes. I'd be like, I, I would be playing my Mary Mary. Go get it. Go get it. You know, go get it. <laughs> go get it. Oh. Sir, I so I wanted to definitely throw that or pose that question to you because I absolutely feel the same way. Yeah, if there was if there's any record that either Pete Sampras or Jimmy Connors still got that Djokovic can get, go get it. No, go, get it. Get, go listen to Mary Mary and go get it. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, Isaac, we have really covered some stuff in this episode. This yeah, this has been great, but. One of the things we we we've got to talk about before we get out of here is to our BOT family. Um, this is the first year we are doing a fundraiser at the end of the year. Yes. We have set up a GoFundMe page, and if you go to GoFundMe.com and look us up under Brothers on Tennis, uh, you will find our page. Uh, if you go to our Instagram site, we have a link directly to that site. Um, in our bio. And as always, you can go to our um, our website and we have a donation page up there in the top right hand corner. Um, you know, we enjoy bringing you all the coverage on site and producing the shows and, you know, the travel and the airline tickets and the rental cars and all of that kind of good stuff. And we've been happy to fund that so far out of our own pockets. But, uh, you know, we were like, you know what? Let's see if we can get a little help with this this year. <laughs> you know, Isaac, you know, I know you have some thoughts on this. 
Well, yeah, exactly, folks. I mean, again, we are family and we are trying to do our best to bring this brand of tennis analysis to you. And again, this is not about Bryce and I getting paid. We are not trying to get, you know, put money in our pockets. We simply want to be able to keep the lights on and bring this content uh, to you all. Mm -hmm. So this goes to things like, again, subscriptions to Headliner for us to be able to, you know, to, to do the actual podcast and Adobe. We get monthly bills on these things. We got a GoDaddy, you know, account. It, it's charging us all the time. We got LLC <laughs> funds. Y'all, we got lots of it. It, it is not cheap trying to run a brand. And simply put, we have been funding it out of our pockets for the last four plus years. And we're simply coming to our BOT family to say, hey, if you can, please do. If you can't, trust me, we understand. We are still going to do the best that we can with Brothers on Tennis and bring it to this family and to the public. But again, if you do have something that you are willing to share and or help to support the brand, that's what we're asking you to do. Right. So uh, once again, GoFundMe.com, uh, our bio uh, on Instagram, or even more directly to our website, our donation page. We appreciate anything uh, that you may be able to do. So with that, um, we are off next week, right, Isaac? Correct. Correct. And then we're back the following week on the because we're finally going to reconnect with our guys from At The Net Podcast. Uh, we'll be doing our, our collab show. We've gotten so much good feedback from you guys. You apparently really like those collab shows. So we'll be doing one of those on the 20th. So look forward to that. We haven't uh, chopped it up with the guys in a while. So we, we have a lot to catch up on. And we're going to do a year in review episode with them. So yes. uh, look forward to that. Isaac, any final words before we check out? Uh, nothing for me, Bryce. Also, make sure, you, but just ch check out our merch now. We haven't mentioned merch in a while. So if y'all ain't got no BOT gear, go on ahead and look at it. Look up uh, look the website, go to the shop page, and uh, gear is always there for you. Yeah, that's another way you can help us financially is by, uh, you know, helping with our merch sales. So definitely appreciate that. So on behalf of the podcast, this has been your boy, Bryce. And this is your boy, Isaac. And we are Brothers on Tennis. Everyone have a wonderful week.